whatever we do, whatever any of you do, you must compete with the best in the world. Steve Jobs was not an inventor. He was an integrator of technologies. He was an, really somebody who cared for the consumer and put something into the pocket of the consumer. My father got to build India's first battle tank uh, after the war with China. I say battle tank because once I said tanks and somebody said Syntex tanks and I felt really <laughs> bad about it, you know. 2030, what will this classroom be talking of? Not generative AI. Our guest is a true luminary in the world of manufacturing and engineering. With a remarkable career spanning 37 years, including an impressive 21-year tenure as managing director and CEO, he has left an indelible mark on the industry. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great honor that we welcome Mr. Bipin Sondhi. His journey through the world of manufacturing, engineering, and leadership is nothing short of inspiring, and we are eager to delve deeper into his insights and experiences. Currently, he holds the esteemed position of chairman at CII's National Forum on Industry, Academia Partnership for R&D and Innovation, and as chairman of the National Board for Quality Promotion at the Quality Council of India. He also serves as a pivotal member of CII's National Council. But that's not all. His influence extends beyond corporate corridors. Mr. Sondi selflessly dedicates his time and expertise as a senior advisor and board member to a range of both for-profit and not-for-profit organizations. He's on the board of trustees for the Bharatiya Yuva Shakti Trust, the Ananta Center, and the Sasaskawa India Leprosy Foundation. Furthermore, he's a respected member of the technology advisory group appointed by the principal scientific officer of the government of India and a key figure in the governing council of the Foundation for Innovation and Technology Transfer at IIT Delhi. Mr. Sondi furthers his contributions to the field of robotics and autonomous systems as a member of the governing board of IHUB for Robotics and Autonomous Systems Innovation Foundation at IISC Bangalore, an alum of the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, and the Indian Institute of Technology, New Delhi. Mr. Sondi did his schooling at the Lawrence School, Sanawar. His accomplishments actually know no bounds. He's had a fantastic long career, and it is honestly our Honor and pleasure to host him today. Please put your hands together for Mr. Griffin Sondi. So, Mr. Sondi, we'll jump right into it. Your career has been marked by remarkable achievements, one which we were just listening. In your own words, if you could share with us some of your accomplishments that hold a special place in your heart and elaborate on why they were significant in shaping your journey. First, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Kanav, for a very generous introduction. Yeah, it's awkward. But let me, uh, perhaps, it's lovely to be here. This is my third time, so I keep coming back uh, for whatever reason. But it's great to be amongst uh, young people. And that is where I would want to spend my next 10 years, interact with the young people and with future technology. And that, uh, that has to be the focus. So I, do, I don't know what you mean by accomplishments. They mean different things to different people. But I'll tell you a little bit about the journey and maybe three turning points in the journey that I had that uh, then put me into manufacturing, not where many people wanted to go. Uh, first was uh, staying back in India. So after IIT, 97% of my batch left and I had done my and GRE, etc., and got admission, got the assistantships and all, but chose not to go. Same thing happened after IMA. Again, a lot of the batch went, and for whatever reason, I didn't go. Again, I went through GMAT, went through TOEFL, etc. I don't know what the exams are now, but the equivalent of those uh, at that point in time. And that was basically because one gets very influenced by dining table conversations that parents hold. And whether they do it on purpose or not, I don't know. But they never held me back. So I got all the support to go overseas. My elder brother went overseas. But uh, I chose to stay back because uh, there were some really, really leading lights who would come home for dinner. Those were the top CEOs at that point in time. My father got to build India's first battle tank 
uh, after the war with China. So government gave him that role at a very young age to build a, a battle tank. I say battle tank because once I said tanks and somebody said syntax tanks and I felt really <laughs> bad about it, you know. But this was called the Vijanta tank, uh, etc. And then later on he had a career. So it was all about building for the country and many of that generation had were the first generation whose parents had fought for independence. So that's how the conversations took place. And for some reason, at the last minute, I wouldn't go overseas. I stayed back and I think I'm delighted with that. So these are choices that you will be confronted with at every point in time. And these choices are right, wrong, there's nothing lit, but something will influence you to make a choice. And fortunately now, you are in a position to make the choices at different points in time as well. Like you've chosen to come here after work X and actually come to be here and study forward. The second was manufacturing. Now, who would want to go into manufacturing? Those who stayed back went into FMCG that time. There were a lot of people who went to Ponds, uh, Colgate, etc. after IIT. Nothing to do with engineering. Uh, and nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. But they chose to go in what were the new age companies at that time and FMCG was coming uh, forward. Similarly, after IMA, it was finance and banking. Banking was the financial services was the new one. But I continued to decide to stay in manufacturing again because that was my passion. So follow your passion right through. Make those choices. Do what you enjoy doing the most. And now the opportunities are many, many fold. The third was I, became, I was fortunate to become the CEO of an American company that made compressors uh, for, for refrigerators and air conditioners at a fairly young age of 34 or 35. And one of the acquisitions we made was uh, from a leading brand which makes, even today, American brand which makes refrigerators, air conditioners, washing machines, etc., white goods. They didn't want their compressor facility, so this was bought. I was made in charge. I was already in the company, made in charge. And when we went there, we saw that no due diligence had been done, and it was complete mayhem on the shop floor, etc., in terms of people wandering around, about 1,500 people, quality, there was no signs of it, material on the shop floor. Because it was going to be sold, I think there was no interest taken by the seller. And the buyer, which was us, didn't do our due diligence properly. It was a huge learning uh, that always do due diligence. But one of the lines over there, so if it's 1,500 people, complete mayhem, they probably work three hours, union completely in control, management completely out of control. And, but one of the lines was working full time. 10 people always sitting and always zero defect in a place which didn't deserve or we didn't even know what we were producing, so to speak. And I took time with that line, and that line was happy, they were smiling. Ten people, zero defect, small components, fine components, etc. One of them, his name was Ashok, is, is Ashok. He would hum as he spoke, and people around him seemed to be inspired. The workplace was, like yours, extremely neat, clean, and all the tools of the trade were as positioned. You've done 5S, it's basically a place for everything and everything in its place. Fundamentally, everything was there. I got to know Ashok well, and I also got to know why he did it. Ashok was blind. He couldn't see. So if the tools were not there, he wouldn't be able to do it. He was grateful for the job he had at hand. He inspired the other nine people to be producing to zero defect. And he was grateful that he could feed his family with the job he had, which is why he smiled, he couldn't see, but he did his work diligently. What we decided to do was to use these 10 people as a center of inspiration, not as a center of excellence, but as a center of inspiration. We also decided that we must become world class in three years. American company, pride of make in India, can we do it? The answer is yes. And we got an investment at that time, we got in ozone-friendly technology, etc. But the same 1,500 people were converted into world-class because we were able to inspire them through just 10 people and use that as a tool. 
Now, very often you use role models to inspire. And this was my turning point for having learned from a completely selfless, uh, challenged person to be able to convert in, uh, uh, an organization into a world-class organization, which then started competing with LG, Samsung in other parts of the world. So can it be done? But that was a turning point. And then the story repeated in a different way in JCB and then in Ashok Leyland. But uh, these are the turning points which influence one. One last story that very often, how many of us know the names of the people who cook for us on campus? Does, do you have a mess here? No, you don't have a mess. But many of you have come from other colleges and institutions. How many of you knew the sanitation staff? How many of you knew the horticulture staff? How many of you knew the, the cooks and the chefs? Great, but tell me an example. Why, why would you know them? Any, anyone, why would you know them? They don't directly impact. Who directly impacts? Your teachers, your others. Why would you know their names? You meet them daily. You meet them daily. And what, what would be a conversation between you and uh, any one of them? How was your day? Okay, no, great. And I think it's wonderful, yeah. Rohan? A lot of consumer insights also come from, from them. It's, it's uh, the social group they come from. Okay. What, what, what are the conversations happening? So, or even the Ola drivers, well, uh, the Uber drivers. Yeah. It's very, uh, like, I try to get them. Okay, great. Anybody else? Yeah, one last one. Yeah, go ahead. So, I'll just give you an example of the time that says we are at Masterpiece. So it's got a great physique and I, I'm, I'm one of the person who like keeps keeps on sitting at the college. So we usually sit together and work things and just chills with me and we just have random conversations about how he makes his body, how can he train me to become fit up. No, so that's wonderful. What we do often is walk past these people. Those who are uh, really, let's say in our college campus, not here, but in any other college campus, those who are actually working as Malis, those who actually make the pulkas for us, etc. What we decided to do in one of the companies I worked with is to make a film for them and make a whole film where they would just come and speak extempore. And many of them were in tears as they spoke as to why, uh, and they didn't even know why they were called or etc. But if you want to create a world-class institution that every member of that institution, regardless of his or her role, has a role to play. If we are not happy with the food that we get, we will be unhappy. But as long as we are happy, we just go away. We, we often, I mean, you go to a formal restaurant, maybe, but if, you, if it's a mess or a canteen, maybe not. People who clean our toilets. So our learning was everybody, anywhere, must be involved in the process of motivation, training, development, and it's an investment. It's not an expense, it's an investment. That uh, very insightful and very motivating story about uh, Ashok. The next question which I have for you, sir, is success often comes hand in hand with challenges. Can you provide insights into some of the formidable obstacles you encountered on your journey? How did you navigate these difficulties and what valuable lessons did these moments teach you? See, there will be no obstacles in life, so there will be challenges. Uh, there will not be obstacles. Uh, you will be challenged, we are all challenged and the question is, how do we find a way around these challenges? So I'll give you an example. I got to uh, uh, be the CEO of a, a, a company called JCB. At that time it was a company, now it's become a brand and a brand for all the wrong reasons. It tends to be demolishing, etc. But it was a, it was a lesser known thing in, in the mid 2000s. Nobody really knew about it, etc. And again, a turning point, this, when I joined, fortunately or unfortunately, the, there were about, we used to make about 15 or 20 machines a day. And nobody, again, knew quality, etc. It was not really regarded as a major initiative by the two owners. And fortunately, when one, they got divorced in a sense and JCB UK became a single owner. Uh, that helps because when you have one ownership, it's good. Otherwise, the CEO gets sandwiched when it's a joint venture. Uh, remember that as well, okay? Uh, a dysfunctional joint venture is not where you want to be a CEO. So I turned it down five years prior when they came. But when, when it became a single ownership, then it became important. 
Now, making 15 or 20 machines a day was with overtime, with a lot of maramari as we'd call it. And every evening, even the CEO down clapping if 15 machines were made was not the way we wanted to do. So one evening in Delhi, close to Delhi, we decided, six of us decided to just sit down on a very cold January. We were really depressed. And we sat down in a small room, got a whiteboard. And uh, I found the first six people there and we, we decided to go there. And fundamentally, we said, where do we want to be? So I've got this chart which we kept for the next 15 years that I was CEO. Just the chart which really said, where are we now? And it was at the bottom end of the left-hand corner of the XY axis which said, we are firefighting every day. Where do we want to be? And a youngster, younger than all of you at that time, he's still there. He was 26 at that time. He said, sir, I want to be able to export. Now, that was a big word he used, export. We couldn't even think of this. So we said, okay, we will be world class. So I drew another blob, which was on the right hand corner and said world class. And we said only in one parameter. Let's be world class in one parameter. And that will be global quality. We will aspire to be global quality. Everything else will fall in the way because we'll have to set up processes. We'll have to set up plants. We'll have to get technology. Whatever we do, we have to cross the road, we will do it the right way. Okay? And the middle path, we said, how long will it take? And we put a 10-year time frame. So, 2005, 2015, we should be able to export heavy machines out of India. We finished that process by 2011. And now, JCB machines from India, not now, but last 7-8 years, they're going to America. America just writes, made in USA. That's all they do. They go to France, they go to Australia, and they asked specifically not JCB UK machines, we want JCB India built machines, right? So it can be done. It's a matter of pride. We wanted to excel in whatever. And this turning point was this 26 year old person at that time said, my aspiration is to export. I don't want to do this every day. He's still there. And now, of course, it's something that we'll talk about, the importance of being world class. Whatever we do, whatever any of you do, you compete. You must compete with the best in the world. We are the best and all of you are, you know, you are world class. Uh, this generation is great. In just the two questions you've answered, you've already made it very clear that values mean a lot to you. And uh, your commitment to values is truly inspiring. Could you share with us some of the core values that have shaped your journey? What is it about these values that you hold in such high regard? And how have they influenced your leadership philosophy? See, ultimately, uh, everybody likes and wants uh, to be able to look up to role models. And often we don't have them. You, know, you, you therefore have to tread your own path because... Many of our leaders are not setting uh, the best of examples. For me, Ashok was my role model. For me, that 26-year-old chap who said that he wants to have a deeper purpose in life was a role model. So the big one is trust. And there are three drivers in my view to trust. One is, and this is on leadership and I'll come to specifically to values. One is authenticity. That people see you as you are. No different. They see you as you are. The second driver is logic. That you want to see your leader who will be able to think rationally, especially in a time of crisis. Think objectively, especially in a time of crisis. And the third driver is empathy. That I, as a colleague, will be valued for my opinion. So empathy for me is not agreement at all. As a leader, empathy or as the CEO, empathy was never agreement. Empathy was, I listen to you and I will tell you why I agree or disagree with you. But will you have an opportunity to speak? The answer is yes. And that applied to young people more than anybody else. So that is trust. If any of these three drivers fall off, the trust goes. And then you're a leader because you have a position. Your position should only be there because people want you there. 
not because you've been put there for a particular purpose. When that comes integrity, there is no compromise on doing the right things. Zero compromise. And it isn't that this is the way it's done in India. So the answer is, can it be done? The answer is yes. Some organizations do it, some organizations don't, and we actually can call them out. The third is respect. We talked about that. Respect, and, and from there comes humility. Respect for everybody because each person is doing the job allotted to him or her. And that's why we talked about people we often walk past. We shouldn't do that. Everybody has a right to be respected. Third is what you said. Always be, now from a business standpoint, be customer centric. He is the one or she is the one who pays our bills, our salaries. We must be sensitive to our customer. Ensure long-term relationships. There is no short-term relationship. Fourth, continuous learning. You, I mean, the amount of certificates you guys manage, I don't know how you do it, but you are always learning. You've got to continue to do that because things are changing so rapidly. Continue to reskill, upskill yourselves. And the duty is of your organization to do it for you if you're not able to do it yourself. There are certain things you just can't afford to do. So the organization's duty is to invest in its people. It is not a PNL number. Sustainability, make sure that everything we do is circular. That's new now. Many of us didn't do it for many, many years. We weren't even aware. You are much more aware. Just make sure that there's a process that takes it back all the way so that we give back to the planet more than we take from the planet. At the end of the day, we should be positive in what we return to the planet. And finally, for me, teamwork over individual brilliance. I would, I would call people out openly if they try to project themselves as the ones having done the work. It has to be teamwork, teamwork much stronger than individual brilliance. Back to you. Excellent. This, uh, I believe, could have been a full two-hour class. These are such important values you spoke about. But uh, unfortunately, we have limited time. Bipin sir, as a strong proponent of gender equality and women's empowerment, could you share your insights on the pivotal role women play in business world and discuss both the existing initiatives and potential strategies to further empower women in entrepreneurship and in business? So I hope we stop asking this question five years down the line. It should just become uh, very normal. And it's actually for men to answer this question, really not for women to answer this question. Very often we ask women, why shouldn't this happen? And they probably wonder, why the hell is you asking us? The important thing is that, I'll give you an example. It's not for women who are uh, studying the way uh, you are. But we decided to set up a new plant, again, for, uh, for earth moving equipment. And we decided it will be in Jaipur. And we also decided that the welding machines, which are the most difficult, must be run by women. And we also decided we'll go to villages, not to Jaipur, but villages in Rajasthan and try and bring them. The easiest thing was not to do it. And there were enough people who said, don't do it. Why waste your time, etc. But actually the team went down and from villages made sure that we call the parents first to see this brand new spanking facility, give the comfort. We even called brothers. We called the male members, the panchayat leaders, all of them to come in. And then we actually started training the initial cohort of women who came in. In three years, the Prime Minister of UK herself, a lady at that point in time, which was about seven, eight years ago, was visiting. And she asked to meet the women welders of JCB India. And we got them uh, into the High Commissioner's uh, residence. And from being from small towns like Nagore, etc., where they'd never been out, they were talking to a prime minister and they were able to talk to her eye to eye. Of course, she was careful to speak slowly. But look at where they came from and look at how much glory that they bring and the capability. So you give the opportunity, that opportunity will be a huge investment. I think 
Fundamentally, what happened? We thought we will improve the shop floor. What happened was that they became inspiration points in their respective villages for other girls to try and emulate them. So this change then happens within society. And that's what I think all of us need to endeavor for. But here we have a large talent pool. You bring in women, you have a huge talent pool. You have a completely, not completely, but often different perspectives that are taken for granted. Uh, completely 50% of the consumers are women. How do you ensure that you plan your strategies uh, accordingly outside? Collaboration comes, I think, much easier. Empathy comes easier. Creativity comes easier. So there are a whole host of advantages. And I only hope this question is, ceases to be asked five years, ten years down the line. All of us have to contribute. It's truly inspiring. And uh, I agree with you. I hope five, ten years from now, we don't have to ask this question. The change has come in that much time. During your talk at the Confederation of India Industries session at Navigating Strategic Inflection Points in Business, you provided invaluable insights into identifying soft signals of impending shifts in the business landscape. Could you delve deeper into this concept, explaining how recognizing these signals can provide businesses with strategic advantages? So I'll start with some examples. Uh, how many of you had a Nokia phone 10 years, 15 years? Well, you were too young, but uh, we, okay. Oh, many had a Nokia. How many of you have a Nokia phone now? I'm not, not using it, but you have it over there. Saurabh also is unsure. I'm not, using <laughs> not using it. And why? Yeah. So Nokia was right on top, the leader. They felt that they couldn't uh, be brought down and yet they disappeared uh, in, uh, in a very short span of time. How many of you had heard of Kodak? Any of anybody had heard of Kodak? Yeah, you've heard of almost everybody's heard of Kodak. Uh, how many of you have used a Kodak film in the recent past? No, recent past. Okay, Madhav, you must be a unique guy. What what are you doing with the Kodak? Testing the antique camera. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sometimes antiques are old is gold. Yeah, so now Kodak has become uh, antique, and he's right, I and mean, he's not, not not wrong at all. So what happened to these companies? There's another one called Blockbuster Videos. I, that's really an American thing. Disappeared overnight. Completely disappeared overnight. So why did they go? Nokia's engineers actually formally put a proposal to their top management on bringing in a camera into the phone at a very early stage. This is before Steve Jobs had actually came up with the... Uh, with uh, an iPhone and then a camera. It was shot down by people who were in an ivory tower somewhere sitting in Finland and, and the rest is history. Blockbuster Video was probably the greatest video rental agency in the world. Disappeared overnight when OTTs started coming and then Netflix came up overnight, just disappeared. Kodak. People think that Kodak didn't move into the digital space. Kodak was the first to move into the digital space. So you went into any of the major, uh, major uh, stores, went into any of the major stores in America, there was a Kodak kiosk where you could get your digital photograph printed. Disappeared overnight. Okay, why did these guys go? Why did Kodak disappear? It went into digital, but it didn't foresee sharing of photographs through a screen. People no longer needed to print. Gone. Nokia, because it refused to integrate many technologies which were available. Steve Jobs was not an inventor. He was an integrator of technologies. He was an, really somebody who cared for the consumer and put something into the pocket of a consumer. What is the way for the CEO to connect except through the hierarchy? Simply by going and meeting people at the cutting edge, which is the people who actually sales, service, those who are at the shop floor. Those are the people that the CEO has to meet personally, one, and create forums where they have the opportunity to meet. 
you can have a forum like this coffee with the ceo tea with the ceo whatever what does the ceo do spend a lot of times in meetings so one of my learnings very early in life was my then boss said you're new you're only 35 i don't want you to fail do one thing two days of a week are yours for meetings three days let your team decide what they want to meet you for i reduced that by the time i finished with the show cleland to two hours a week was mine and the rest of the time was purely what my colleagues wanted me to do of course i decide ultimately what i wanted to do which meant going out fanning out meeting dealers meeting customers meeting people who are at the cutting edge service people they are the best people in the sales situation those who are in an airline the front desk receptionist in a hotel those are the people we need to meet to be able to understand what are the changes taking place in the marketplace why the time it reaches formally in a presentation all is lost okay so one of the things is direct absolutely direct to go the second is diverse perspectives make sure that you don't have only one type of people or one gender of people or one ethnicity of people in your meeting rooms make sure that you have diverse perspectives coming in and the third is 80% of all decisions taken by a ceo are ir are reversible believe me 80% are reversible ceo doesn't have to take them you only have to take the permanent decisions and those which are culturally inviolable every other decision creates small agile teams led by young people and let them lose you can always change the decision you can always guide them so if you have to buy land you have to buy invest in technology you've got to deal with the government the ceo can do that everything else is reversible moving on mr sandhi in your observation and you said this earlier also when you spoke about how the manufacturing industry has declined the manufacturing industry was overshadowed by the service sector in recent decades in your view what are the root causes of this trend and how critical is it for us to address this disparity furthermore what proactive steps can be taken to overcome this challenge and reposition the manufacturing sector as a powerhouse of innovation and growth fundamentally what would you want india to be known as 10 years down the line anybody wants to answer that what would you want india to be known as superpower superpower okay and we'll come back to how you define superpower superpower as a you can't do it by going to the gym how does a country become a superpower we'll come back to it. just think of two ideas completely self reliant self reliant okay so janya so we'll come back to self reliance uh, as what you mean by it okay income inequality to remedy okay income inequality i think i would like india to be a provider for the nation okay higher per capita and okay higher per capita make it in india for the world okay make it in india for the world okay Okay, let's come back to superpower. What do you mean by superpower? Just two points, nothing more than that. Yeah. So, uh, in online fashion, I mean, yes, it's easy for a country to exert global influence, dominance, uh, in terms of military strength, economic strength, and economic strength. Okay, so let's just take two: technology and economics. Okay. All right. You need to have that. Yeah. Okay. self reliance uh, uh you asked so jan yeah yeah so i was saying that self reliance is a matter of uh, focusing more towards manufacturing okay yeah all right we need all of our needs as well okay income equality inequality is very clear and provider to others also very clear that comes from the ability to be able to so in one of these you've already mentioned technology right technology in a sense uh, self reliance is also rooted in to be able to be technologically superior so if i were to just take one thing it should be our ability to create technology okay so now how do people get wealth wealth inequality if you can generate enough wealth then it depends on what kind of system 
the country is governed by and hopefully you can redistribute that wealth in, in, a, in a better way. And provider to others, which means we should be able to export more and more, is first we should be technologically capable of doing that. So how do countries acquire wealth? One way is to colonize, right? That's why how a lot of countries acquired wealth. One particular country came as guests. They stayed on for 200 years with us. Yeah. But unlikely that's a route that can be taken now except by one or two who are currently trying to do it. But otherwise, it's not an easy route. The second is if you have some natural resource which God has given you and you're able to use it, which is like oil, for example. You have a natural resource and you literally milk that natural resource for generations. Again, not a sustainable way. The third is when you are quick followers of technology, like China started, copy fast and then scale it up. Works for some time, but now they are actually generators of technology. My only thought is unless we create technology, we will not have a long term ability to be able to self reliant inequality, etc. Because that is wealth. True wealth is intellectual property. That is true wealth. Which is why in, now to answer your question, what should we do? Three things. We must invest more and more in research and development, especially in people, and focus them on research and development, which means we must recognize people who are doctorates, PhD, etc., and give them that space. Again, government is more proactive than industry. The second is collaborate with educational institutions. Today, our industry, all of us, we are, I'm guilty of it as well, have been going and buying technology from overseas or bringing in people over here, the Japanese, the Koreans, etc., who keep technology with them and only tell us what to do, but not how to do it. So we never learn. And then we have to go back again to buy technology. And the third is get scale through exports. We have to build the confidence to be able to sell overseas. Some companies have, many companies have not, some are trying, but it doesn't mean as contract manufacturers, as brands. We must have a Sojanya brand that people should buy. We have a Rohan brand that people should buy. They should buy us as brand made in India. These are the three things that we need to do going forward. And a lot of work is going on, except that we've, we've started now, so it's never too late to start. But research and development, that's fortunately an area that I'm fortunate to be playing a part with. You look at our new IITs, the laboratories are supported by Samsung, by LG, by MG Motors. Where are Indian companies? Not supporting any labs. Easier to buy technology. We are trying to change that mindset. And that mindset must change when you guys assume leadership positions, which is why I wanted to mention it to you. Question it. Why can't we do it? The question is, we can do it. We're just not willing to put down large resources up front. It'll change. It'll change in five years. This answered the question I was going to ask. So I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to move on to the next one. In your thought-provoking article, Generative AI in Manufacturing, a Transformational Alliance, you talk about how a company had to translate an equipment manual from Mandarin to English, then go on video call with the Chinese engineers to identify and debug a manufacturing, a malfunctioning PLC. It wasn't long ago that this seemed impossible. And the only solution was to fly down an engineer from China, Germany, who would first come diagnose the problem, fly back, and then come back with parts to replace. Often it would be so. Disruptive and these machines, their equipments would break down. With generative AI coming into the picture now, you say this will change. You say we can leverage generative AI in the manufacturing space. Please uh, elaborate on that. How can we Okay, how many of you have used chat GPT? Everybody. <laughs> Uh, how do your professors distinguish between one uh, one uh, answer and the other? Yeah, they GPT it. 
they also use it. Yeah, no, there's no harm in using it. I mean, the, uh, the thing is, uh, there is never any harm in using it. The question then is only that, is it stopping us from thinking? But let's move to 10 years later. 2030, what will this classroom be talking of? Not generative AI. Yeah, generative AI? You guys spoke about generative AI. I mean, that's uh, passe. Yeah, Shubhika? So, it's probably going to be artificial capability intelligence, where you actually then bring in more and more capability into part of artificial intelligence. And that can be worrying, because that will be able to generate certain actions, like even have a conversation on the telephone with us, without us knowing uh, whether it's a bot or it's a human being. Because it will have enough data stored in to have an intelligent conversation. That's what generative AI is. Trained with trillions of, uh, trillions of different words, access to the internet, and everything is out in the open. So the question really is that, I don't think in your lifetime there's too much of a worry. But what happens in the future is for us to worry about. And then, actually, how can we actually put containment, uh, uh, you know, have some containment, etc. But coming back to your question on generative AI, for me in manufacturing, Madhav, pay attention. In manufacturing, it takes me back to whatever. Yeah. But in, in manufacturing, what happens as long as you have a set of data points and you can feed them in, you will see trends that you would otherwise not be able to see. So you have an existing set of data points. Let's say worldwide, you have cars going out. They have a, 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 a braking issue. You factor those data points in and the chances are you, your engineers will see something, but long-term trends you will struggle with. That's what generative AI will do for you. And that's what then you can respond in a longer term basis. Similarly, product design, you can get a lot of designs through generative AI and then choose instead of sitting down, one person, two people sitting down to design the automobile of the future. You put in as input at data points where you are today, what it's likely to be, etc. Generative AI will give you 10 opportunities. So there's lots that you can use it like your sidekick. Literally like your sidekick, use generative AI, but then develop upon it. But for that, you need to be training your models all the time. For that, you need to be getting data points. What it cannot do is it can connect dots, but can it identify the next dot? Generative AI cannot identify the next dot. Artificially capable AI will be able to identify the next dot. That's where we need to worry. Five years ago, we would have said that even generative AI is not possible. Five years, and now we are saying, okay, empathy, where will that come? Curiosity, these are all human traits. But if there are enough capability built in, the chances are you'll be able to do that as well. But on this note only, AI does have a limitation. Currently also, even the generative AI has a tendency to hallucinate, go off yeah. track, right? Okay. There's some risk. In, and you're talking, when this is applied to real industries where real money is in the picture, and uh, large decisions are being made. Is there no risk in your opinion? Well, there's a lot of risk, of, obviously. Therefore, the human mind is still there to ensure that you're able to mitigate that risk. And thank God for that, that the human mind can still overrule, overrun everything else that generative AI can, can do. So, um, now I've read a couple of your papers and uh, you speak about mentoring very passionately and the importance of mentoring. And over here, we're all uh, very firm believers of the importance of mentoring and being guided. So, could you talk about how you see mentoring, how it helped you in your life, in your journey? Yeah, so thanks. It's important. It's even more important today than it was uh, in, in the time we had informal mentors. You found somebody elder, he liked you, you liked them, chemistry good. And you say, okay, kind of ad adapt a relationship and mentoring started. But it's essentially sharing of wisdom acquired by a person over a period of time with person normally younger, normally much younger. 
so that you can actually create opportunities for that. You can paint a picture and then that person can decide which part of the picture that he or she wants to be. But sometimes you're confronted with value-driven choices. Should I or should I not? And it could mean loss of a job, it could mean your resignation, etc. Those are times when you need the wisdom more than any time else, when you're reaching crisis situations. But it cannot be transactional. It has to be built over a period of time, which is why mentoring today is very important. You know, I think Chaitanya, you asked, how do I have a framework, etc. Organizational mentoring will actually take you through a process. So every organization and every institution must have a process of mentoring. If it doesn't, please ask for it. Because that will be a more organized framework. But my suggestion is have a professional mentor, but also have a personal mentor. So there will be certain things about the family that you might want to discuss, which become difficult at this point in time. It could be an elder member of uh, a friend of the family who knows, but who has no agenda at all. For me, reverse mentoring is a, is a great opportunity. So we actually set up uh, institutions where I'd be a mentor, but I also interact with young people to understand technology, especially on technology, especially on aspiration, especially on impatience. All of that are necessary today, which is all part of reverse mentoring. But please do seek out organizationally and please do seek out personally a mentor that you can bounce ideas, thoughts, etc. And it cannot be transactional. It should be over a period of time. Do it actively. When you're stuck with a crisis, then going to somebody who doesn't have your complete background, you might get the wrong answer. I'll take the liberty of asking this question because I have this question right now. Yeah. How do we identify and you know, choose who should mentor us? It has to be you. A lot of it is to do with somebody you trust. I'm talking of personal. Organization is different because many times you don't have an opportunity. But when you look at it personally, it will have to be somebody you trust, somebody who you have a conversation with every now and then. And somebody who has your interests at heart. And there's always that somebody. Oh, by chance, you have to give it a by chance, we ho jata hai, but sometimes it's staring you in the face. Organizationally, you may not always have an opportunity, but there should be a framework, a process that should be in position. So, lastly, for our students seeking to become future leaders, what areas of learning? And personal development should they focus on to stand out in competitive landscape? What skills, traits and values do you believe will be essential for the leaders of tomorrow to embrace and internalize? Oh, this answer, I think, will come from you guys. I'll, I'll try and uh, see if we can moderate it. Okay, any, any thoughts on one, only one each, maximum one each. Don't rattle off everything. Future leaders, traits, yeah, Rohan? I think it will be era of contemplation. Because most of the work will, like maybe new technologies will take over. So how deeply you can contemplate? Yeah. Okay. I think uh, it should be of servant leadership. Sorry. Servant leadership. What is that? Servant leadership means uh, suppose uh, uh, I, you have to be a people leader. Huh? People's leader. People's. I think one critical aspect is uh, corporate governance. Okay. That takes to be. Zid honi chahiye. Zid honi chahiye. Liberal mind. Liberal mind. Just because of people's identities, you should not, uh, like, you know, stop them from participating. Yeah. What's your name? Sanya Nishka. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Nishka. We, we met recently. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I think um, uh, being in love with what you do gets you to, you know, do it without counting the hours that you're doing it for. So I'll say, like, love for your work. And that way you'll motivate others as well. Exactly. Yeah, others as well too. Yeah. Okay, great. Yep. Okay. Okay, but you have all the answers here. Yeah. There's 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 a huge list, and someday you should actually sit down as a cohort, write it down and cross out how many such examples that see my view is and you take off from being in love with what you um, what you have is 
I think fundamentally the organization should have a purpose, you know, deep purpose, something that is existential. Why do we exist? And that's the starting point. And all of you in some way identify with it. So it's not about profit, it's not about uh, things, but something that you identify. It could be sustainability. You want to be with uh, organizations that are sustainable. That young guy who, who told us that he wants to be able to compete globally, export, compete globally, that became a purpose. Before we know, knew it, we were exporting to 100 countries. We didn't even know it just happened. So the second is the values and the behaviors. The second level below purpose is that what do we practice every day? A leader has to practice, who well, lives in an ivory tower, has to be practicing and behaving at a level that people will be inspired on a daily basis. The third then comes to vision. So when we talk of a global mindset, absolutely. But I'm putting it at number three, that you must have a vision for your organization. At the end of the day, there must be something that you can put down in terms of where you want to be. And fourth then becomes strategy. How do you achieve that vision? And the finally is the tactics. Now the leader essentially has to identify the deep purpose and also articulate the vision and has to live by that every day. You just can't afford to say, Aaj main nahi karunga. let me today, let's say, compromise on my values. Let me do it once. It has to be done in this country. Let me compromise on it. There is no, there is no coming back. Uh, customer centricity. You compromise one, your people won't, they'll always cite it as a precedent. So the, in the words of somebody who led a major organization, you inspire through purpose. Okay, but you motivate through emotion. Your people should be able to give their life for you because they trust you. But the inspiration will come from the purpose. Many CEOs don't do it enough, which is immerse yourself in the battlefield with your colleagues. There are times if they're going through a crisis, be with them. Just as formerly generals would do. You've got to be with your people in the middle of the action. If you're having a, a union strike or you're having something, you should be there with everybody. The union guys are also your people. Yeah. You should be able to go there without being fear, without fearing you'll get physically bashed up because they will not do it. Third is culture of continuous learning. I can't stress that enough. Learn from you. You've acquired all the degrees that there are. Continuous learning, especially in this day of technology. And finally, be directive with your people. Be directive, but also be inclusive. See, somebody's got to take a decision at the end of the day. For me, if 80% of the people were by and large aligned, alignment, I was fine. Just go ahead, it would get done. We had to take a decision anyway. But alignment is important. So there are a lot of things for a leader to do, but most of it is by example. Even by walking, you'll set examples which people will do. It. Yeah. So finally, just to repeat, you inspire through the purpose of the organization, but you motivate through emotion. Get people emotionally connected. And the only way you can do it is if you're with them, if you're one amongst them, if you're humble, if you're able to help when it matters. With that, I... Would like to thank you. Would everybody please put your hands together and thank you.